Good morning, friends. We're going to close out the week by looking back at what Richard Dawkins claims about God. And while we simply won't have time to address every single point that he makes, as I'd like to if we if we could, but we're, we are going to hit the high points, which should give us sort of a pattern and, and the principles that we would use to deal with the rest of his accusations as well. Because again, in Sunday's message, based on the parable of the talents, specifically the interaction between the third servant and his master, we saw that people often make accusations against God as a justification as to why they do not believe in or submit to or serve him. But those accusations always end up being false accusations. They always end up being illegitimate. And since Richard Dawkins and his accusations against God have been so influential in giving present-day people cover for their own refusal to submit to him, well, let's take a few minutes to look at them, to see how they are. Despite Dawkins' eloquence, despite his passion, despite his ability to kind of play to the crowd, let's see how these accusations are indeed not true. But to remind us what the accusations are, let's read the quote again. Dawkins claims in his book, The God Delusion, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Okay, so... Let's deal with a couple of these things. There's a lot here, of course, but there's three things that immediately jump out at me. Number one, that, that Dawkins calls God petty. He calls him a bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, and then he calls him a homophobe. So let's let's deal first with the idea that God is petty. What does it mean to be petty? Well, when someone is petty, they care too much about things of trivial importance. They make a big deal out of stuff that doesn't actually matter. So when Dawkins calls God petty, he's saying that God cares too much about things that aren't important. And I can only imagine that Dawkins is, re is referring to God's law, which does explain God's standards for lots of things um, in exacting detail, and yet we might consider those things as being unimportant, and therefore God is being petty in going into so much detail. But even as we think about that, we have to ask the question, who, who are we to tell God what is important and what isn't? This is actually another one of those examples of, of when the accusations that we create are accusations based on our own standard of right and wrong, of our own standard of what things ought to be, and then we try to force God to comply with that. Um, and but the, the problem with that is that our own standards are biased. You know, our own standards are designed for our own sake to justify ourselves against God and to condemn God. So of course, if we use our own standard, we can find a way to condemn God and say that He's not good, that He's not doing what He's supposed to do. Um, but in doing this, in this particular example, what Dawkins and so many others miss is that just because God gives that command, that law, in exacting detail concerning something that they would say is unimportant, okay, that doesn't mean that it's actually unimportant, that what God is doing is nonsensical or without purpose. Because if they were willing to look at the law, the command in question, whatever it might be, and if they were to honestly ask, you know, looking for a, 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 an honest answer, why might God be doing this? They would find that there is a reason for God doing it, and an important reason for God doing it. For example, one might say that God is petty for telling his people that they're not allowed to combine different forms of materials and fabric in their garments, okay? Because the, it's true, they, they were not allowed to mix those things, cotton and whatever else it might have been of the day. You know, in modern terms, I'm more familiar with, with modern clothing, you know, the, the thought would be, you cannot wear cotton polyester blend, because you know, that, that combines material. That would be, you know, if we were to transplant today's situation to God's law back then. You couldn't do that. And so the thought would go, well, who cares? Who cares? Like, such a petty thing. Why would God care whether or not you wear a cotton polyester blend or not? Okay. And this would probably go to Dawkins' claim that God is a control freak, freak as well, um, that he is just so you know, uh, meticulous and, and pedantic and he's micromanaging everything everyone does. He is a control freak. There's the claim. But 
again, what might God be doing in giving this command? Something that actually has more significance beyond the particulars of the command itself. Because if we honestly ask that question, we realize, yeah, there's a point to this, an important point to this. Because in so many ways, God was teaching his people that they are not to mix their faith in him, the one true God, with any of the other religions around them. They're to keep their faith, the religion that he is giving them, you might say. They are to keep that pure and not mix it with anything else. And therefore, as a reminder of that, God incorporates the idea of not mixing things into other more mundane aspects of life as a reminder of that far greater principle concerning their beliefs and their religious activity. Because it's not, you know, to use our previous example, it's not that cotton is good and polyester is bad or vice versa. You know, it's just the concept of don't mix. Because worshiping the one true God and only the one true God without mixing anything else in is that important. Because he is the one who leads to life and all others lead to death. So is that really a petty, control freak God in reality? No, it's a God who loves his people and therefore he's willing to build reminders into their everyday lives that will orient them toward life rather than death. Now, how about the idea of God being a bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser? And this overlaps, I think, pretty obviously with the other claims of God being racist and genocidal. Because the critical point quickly to how God ordered the people of Israel in the conquest of Canaan uh, on several occasions to simply kill everyone and everything, to not leave any anything alive. The idea then would be that an entire people group, an entire city would be wiped out. And so you have the accusation of ethnic cleansing of racism and genocide. But there's one very important reason why God's actions in these cases are not actually any form of ethnic cleansing, racism, or genocide. Because each of those terms refers to the idea that you know harmful action is taken against a people group, a nation, or ethnicity simply because they are that nation or ethnicity. For instance, a racist white person hates and acts against a black neighbor according to their racism for no other reason than that the person is black. They're, they're racist, and so they hate black people. Okay, and, and that is obviously great wickedness on their part that should not happen. Okay, and again, equally obvious, if that person were to start a campaign to get all their racist friends together to murder every black person they can find, well, then it goes beyond racism to now ideas of ethnic cleansing and genocide, of course. So with that understanding, how can we say that what God commanded Israel to do concerning the conquest of Canaan, how can we say that that isn't, you know, ethnic cleansing and whatnot? Well, let's go back to our example, but we'll add some, put some changes in there for the sake of illustration. Let's say you have the same white man, uh, but let's say in this case, he's, he's not racist. He does not bear any ill will toward black people uh, or anyone different than him whatsoever, but he happens to have a neighbor who is black and for entirely unrelated reasons, having nothing to do with anyone's color of skin or anything like that at all, um, it simply happens that the, the black neighbor murders the white man's wife. Now, as you might expect, the man whose wife has just been murdered now hates the man who did it. But does the fact that that, that scenario ends up with a white man hating a black man does that mean that the white man is racist? No, because the color of the murderer's skin has no bearing on his hatred for the murderer. His hatred is motivated by the fact that, that his this man murdered his wife. And so, yes, you have a white man hating a black man, but it's not because of racism. It's because of what the black man did to his wife. Okay, so how does that relate to the conquest of Canaan, God's order to basically wipe out everyone in certain scenarios? Well, it has to do with it in this way, because the command God gives, okay, ha is not based on any sort of God's hatred for certain ethnicities or people groups simply because they are those people groups, because God does not hate uh certain ethnicities. God does not hate certain people groups just because they are who they are. God was not saying, go and kill all the Canaanites because I can't stand Canaanites. 
because they're less than human, so kill them all. No, it wasn't racism. It wasn't, uh, God was not acting against a certain ethnicity when God gave this command to the Israelites concerning the conquest of Canaan. No, God was motivated by his justice because long before the conquest of Canaan took place, God laid everything out for Abraham. And in that conversation, God told Abraham that Abraham's descendants would return and enter into the promised land once again, but not until the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The idea being that when Abraham's descendants do come back to the land in that conquest, that conquest would be at least in part because God was using them to judge the Amorites and the other inhabitants of the, of the land for, for their rebellion against God, which actually demonstrates God's judgment in justice, according to justice, but also his mercy and his patience. Because those people were already wicked. They were already in rebellion against God in Abraham's own day. And yet God was going to spare them for hundreds of years, giving them the opportunity to repent and change their ways. But they wouldn't. And so when God sent in the Israelites, it wasn't on account of racism. It wasn't on account of, we need to wipe the specific ethnicity off the face of the earth. No, it was about judgment against a people who had been given centuries to repent and turn to God out of their wickedness, but they refused. It was about justice. Now, to be sure, Dawkins and so many others don't like God's justice, okay? That's what they're trying to get away from with these accusations. And so when they see an example of God's justice in play, well, that's what they're going to act as if it's cruelty, and they're going to act as if it's wicked. And so that's where these accusations of, of ethnic cleansing and genocide and racism come from. When, yes, God did order the, the destruction of these people, but it wasn't based on racism. It was based on justice. And God's justice is perfect and righteous. And no, neither Dawkins nor any of the rest of us have the right to act as if we were in authority over God to tell him that his justice was wrong. Because if we were to say, no, you must do this, well, the so-called justice we would apply in that case would not be justice at all. And finally, Dawkins calls God homophobic. And so the claim is that God hates homosexuals and that's a bad thing that proves how unloving and how unjust God is. But here's the truth. There are a lot of things in God's law that he calls an abomination in his sight. And yes, homosexual behavior is one of them. But if for that reason you can call God a homophobe, then you must call him the equivalent of that for everything else that he says is an abomination, which includes things like liars. God considers lying lips to be abominable in his sight. So shall we then consider God to be a liar-phobe and then blast him for the idea that he says that lying is wrong? No, because lying is wrong. And of course, that leads us to the unpopular truth for, truth for today, is that homosexual behavior is wrong as well. It is a direct rebellion against the way God created man and woman in the beginning. He created man and woman for the man and the woman for each other, to complement each other, to complete each other, to, to become one flesh, man and woman. And so for two men to get together or for two women to get together, that is an explicit and direct rejection of God's purpose and the way that he made things. But here's the thing. Does God very clearly classify homosexuality as a sin? He does. But does that make him a homophobe? No. Now, obviously, those making these accusations against God will, again, disagree vehemently with that. They, of course, they're going to call him a homophobe for this reason. But let's talk about reality here. Because in the way that they use the term, a homophobe is someone who hates homosexuals, who is vindictive toward them, who is nasty toward them, who is just staunch in their opposition and, and would, would harm them if they could get away with it. But let me ask you once again. If we do a good faith examination of the scriptures as a, as a whole, does God hate homosexuals like that, in that way, in the way that, that people claim he does? Because if we say, well, yeah, he does. He, he's a homophobe. He hates them. He's nasty to them. He, he you know, all, all he cares about is destroying them. Well, 
if we're going to make that claim, that accusation, then let me ask you the following question. Why then is he willing to forgive them and grant them eternal life? I mean, it's true. We do, we do not have any scenario specifically recorded in, in the Gospels where Jesus encountered a, a, a gay person. That's to the best of my knowledge, at least. But all over the place, we see him engaging with and encountering prostitutes, right? Interacting with prostitutes. And prostitution would be in the same category of grievous sexual sin, right? And yet Jesus shows incredible compassion to these women, even forgiving them and allowing them to join his disciples, okay? Now, does he tell them essentially, go and sin no more? Yeah, he does. But that's the message for all people regarding all sin, and to point out one sin, yet to forgive them for that sin, that's not hatred. That's love. And just to make it even more clear, in Matthew 12, Jesus says that there is an unforgivable sin. There is but one unfor- unforgivable sin. And it's not homosexuality. It's blasphemy against the Spirit. Therefore, that is an unmistakable, clear indicator that God is willing to forgive homosexuals of their sin. And then in the same way as he does for those who are caught in heterosexual sin, the same as he does for those who are liars or gossips, for those who you know have rage issues or whatever else you might consider, in the same way he does for everyone else that he saves, he saves them out of that sin, cleansing them and sanctifying them to not indulge in that sin anymore. Because by nature, sin destroys and breaks down. And what loving God would leave people in a situation where the destruction will simply continue? No, he forgives them and then pulls them out and brings them to a place where they can experience real life and joy and strength and peace. Now, once again, I am sure that Richard Dawkins would scoff at all of these rebuttals that I've just made. But you know what? That doesn't really matter. Because when the person who is fundamentally disconnected from reality points at you or what you've said and says, that's ridiculous, you don't have to take their words as having any actual weight to them. And I know that might sound mean. That's not the intention. It's just the reality. To put it another way, a person can scream that God is petty or genocidal or homophobic or a bully until they're blue in the face. But their demand for that to be true in order to excuse themselves, that does not make it true. And I really believe for anyone who is willing to be rational and to consider things uh, without that, you know, demand for God to be wrong, I really believe that we have demonstrated how that's what's happening in our examination of Dawkins' accusations this morning. You know, they're just not true. Dawkins and so many other people, uh, they're really smart people, famous people, highly credentialed people. But that doesn't mean you can't still listen to what they say and then conclude for yourself that just doesn't make sense. I love you guys. I pray you have a good and godly day. And Lord willing, I'll see you Sunday.